Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about matrices. In some way, matrices are a natural extension of vectors. Consider we can express a vector as a horizontal array of numbers, where an array is just a bunch of different spaces to put numbers. So each component from a vector would be an entry in that array of numbers. So if we had some vector 5, 47, negative 8, we could also put that as 5, and then a little bit of space, and then 47, and then a little bit of space, and then negative 8, right? We've got this array that's three different locations for numbers to go, right? the sort of rectangular array. Now, a matrix takes this idea and expands on it. So the vector was just a single line, right? It was just a single row going on. So instead of just having columns of numbers, right? We had that single row with three different columns. We can take that and we could have rows and columns. So we'd have rows and columns. And this allows us to show lots of information in a single array. Just like a vector allowed us to show more information than a single number, a matrix will allow us to show even more information than a single vector. So it's a way to compact lots of information into this single really useful thing, and we'll wind up seeing how they're useful in it later on. Matrices have a huge number of uses, both in math and other fields. They're really, really useful things for like science, computer science, engineering, business, economic, oh, so many things. But it's going to take a couple of lessons before we can see how useful they are, because we have to just get the basics of how they work under our belts before we can really see an application. But in two lessons, we'll see how, how ridiculously easy they make it to solve linear systems. So once we have matrices under our belt and have a good understanding of them, we'll be able to just knock linear systems out. It'll be cakewalk for us, which is really cool. Also, I want to mention, so this course, this uh, lesson right here is going to be on how matrices work, what is a matrix, how they interact in various different ways. But many teachers and textbooks don't start with matrices as how does a matrix work. They start with it as specifically using it to solve linear equations through augmented matrices, row operations, and Gauss-Jordan elimination. If that's what you're looking for, if you've got a math class and you're trying to get more understanding of those things, you're going to want to take a look at at the lesson using matrices to solve systems of linear equations. The first half of that lesson will go over augmented matrices, row operations, gauss jordan elimination, and there will be some examples about how that stuff works there. So if that's what you're looking for right now, you might want to go check that out as opposed to this lesson. However, that said, you're going to wind up coming back to everything that's in this lesson. It's just a question of do you introduce the idea of matrices through that stuff first and then go on to talk about how they work, or do you talk about how matrices work and then you get to that stuff later. I prefer talking about matrices first and then getting to the applications, but it depends from teacher to teacher and textbook to textbook. So in your case, you might be interested in watching that lesson first, but you're going to wind up coming back to this lesson and watching it anyway. And some of the stuff in that lesson will make more sense if you watch this one first. So you might even find it worthwhile to watch this lesson before you get around to watching that if you have time. All right, let's get into this. A matrix, so notice a single object is a matrix, but if we're talking about multiple of them in the plural, it's matrices, is a rectangular array where each entry is a number. So an array is just a bunch of sort of like, it's imagined like a bunch of boxes stacked together in, to make a rectangle of boxes. And then inside of each box, you can put a number. So you can put a number here, a number here, a number here, a number here, a number here. And we call each of those places where you can put a number an entry. So we have some A equals some number here, some number here, going all the way down to some number here, some number here, some number here, going all the way down to some number here. And same thing going right as well, right as well. And then there's a bunch of numbers, you know, in the middle. So it's just a rectangular array, a bunch of places to put numbers in this nice rectangular thing. It's like looking at a piece of grid paper and, you know, boxing off some port and part of it and then writing a number inside of each of the grids. All right. For a matrix with m rows and n columns, so notice that it has m rows and n columns. So n columns, m rows. We say it has an order of m by n. So we can put these two things together to talk about the order of the thing of the matrix. This property is also sometimes called size or dimension. Those are sometimes used as synonyms for order. For the most part, we'll just use order in this course, but I might say size occasionally. We can also write order as a subscript m by n. So we write in little, little part underneath it m by n. So if we mainly want to talk about some specific matrix A, for example, we can talk about A, but if we want to mention its order as we're talking about A, we can write its order down, in, by, down just to the side in a subscript m by n. If a matrix has equal numbers of rows and columns, if they're the same number of rows and columns, m is equal to n, we call it a square matrix because we've got a square object. 
Matrices are usually denoted by capital letters like capital A, but you might see other ones as well. Two matrices A and B are equal if they have the same order, so they're the same size, and all of their entries are equal. So they've got the same size, and then if we go to any given one of the locations over here, it's the same as the same location over here. We go to some location here, it's the same as location over here, right? You choose one location here, it's the same thing as this location here. So they have to look exactly the same for them to be equal to each other. I also really want to drive home this fact that it is an M by N matrix with rows by columns. It's always rows by columns. I found this a little bit confusing at first, but uh, I would recommend the way to think about this as a row is something that goes left, right. A column is something that goes up, down. So whenever we're talking about stuff in math, we normally talk left, right, then up, down, right? X comma Y when we're talking about rectangular coordinates. So when we're on the, you know, on the plane, we talk about the horizontal stuff and then the vertical stuff, which is why we talk about the rows, which horizontal thing we're talking about, and then the columns, which vertical thing we're talking about. It might get a little bit confusing as you work through it, but just always remember it's rows, then columns. This order of rows, then columns winds up being very important for a lot of stuff, the way we talk about specific entries. So it's just really important to remember this rows by columns. The best mnemonic I can offer you is thinking in terms of the fact that rows are left, right, columns are up, down, and we go left, right, then up, down. So it's rows, then columns, rows by columns, but it's something you just have to remember. All right, so with this idea in mind that it is rows by columns, let's look at a couple examples. So if we've got a three by three matrix, then that means we have three rows and we have three columns. If we have a two by three matrix, then we have two rows and we have three columns. If we have a five by one matrix, then we have five rows and we have one column, right? Same thing for all these. I also want to point out some of the numbers here. So we can have just, you know, whole numbers like 17, but it's also perfectly fine to have decimal numbers like 4.2. We can have negative numbers like negative 19. We can also have irrational numbers like the square root of 2 or pi. We can have fractions, negative 5 sevenths, 1 half. Anything that's a real number at all can be one of the entries in a matrix. So any number at all can be something inside of a matrix. Talking about specific entries, we can also talk about some specific entry that is in row I and column J in our matrix. And so I and J are just standing in for numbers. We'll swap them out for numbers later when we need to. In A, that is a three by three, so this matrix right here, the entry in row two, column three, is eight. So we go row two, one, two, so we're on this one here, and column three, one, two, third column. So we're on this column here. They wind up intersecting right here. And so we have row two, column three is eight. All right. We can expand on this idea. So we use capitals to denote a matrix, right? Like capital A. So we often use corresponding lowercase letters to denote the entries inside of it. So capital A to denote the entire matrix and lowercase a if we want to talk about some specific entry inside of it. We can talk about a specific entry by using a subscript ij, where a subscript is here's our number and then ij or any subscript is just numbers that are down and to the right of the number. So down and to the right of the number is where we have our subscripts. So we have ij on it, so we can combine those two and we have a sub ij, subscript ij, and that will denote the ith row and jth column. I came first, so that's talking about the rows. J came second, so that's talking about the columns. So A sub IJ is the ith row, jth column. So that means we could talk about A11, one, one, so that'd be first row, first column, so we'd get 17. We could talk about A21, that'd be second row, first column, so that'd be zero. Second row, second column, also zero. We could have A23, second row, third column, so that would be eight. That's exactly what we figured out at the beginning. So row two, column three is A23. Or we could have A32, third row, second column, which gets us three. 
So this gives us another way to talk about where a number is. We can talk about it in terms of this entry and a subscript to say which of the entries it is. With this idea in mind, we have another way to talk about a matrix. As opposed to a matrix as being the entire matrix, or a matrix just being this capital letter that represents it, we can see it as a series of entries represented by this AIJ, right? There's a first row, first column, first row, second column, first row, third column, then second row, first column, second row, second column, third row, second column, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's just a bunch of entries making up the whole things. With this idea in mind, instead of having to write the entire matrix, like right, writing the entire matrix, matrix like this. Um, so we don't have to do the entire matrix. We don't also have to just use a single letter to denote the whole thing, like just A. We can instead refer to it by using a single representative entry to stand in for all entries, A, I, J. So it's like saying, here is some A, I, J that is talking about all of the different guys at once. So we can see what happens to this one guy who's representing all of the guys at once. Notice, since I and J can change, A, I, J is a placeholder for all of the entries in A. It's not just one thing, it's all of them at once. In a way, it's representing all of them at once by letting us see how does one, how does something happen to one of the guys in there. So I J, I throw Jth column. So we have another way to talk about a matrix. All right, at this point, we're ready to actually talk about how we can do some sort of basic arithmetic with our matrices. Given some matrix A and a scalar, that is to say just a real number K, we can multiply the matrix by that number. So K times the matrix A becomes K times AIJ. That is, each of the entries of our matrix A gets multiplied by K. So every entry of A is multiplied by K. Notice that this is just like multiplying a vector by a scalar, right? If we've got some vector and we multiply it by a scalar, then that scalar multiplies on each of the components of the vector, right? It's scaling the vector, it's multiplying each of the components. So if we've got a scalar and we multiply a matrix, that scalar multiplies each of the entries because a matrix doesn't have components, it has entries because we have to talk about the, you know, every row, that's right. A vector is just a single row, but a matrix is many, so we talk about multiplying all of the entries. So other than that distinction between entries or components, it's very much the same thing. A scalar on a vector multiplies each of its numbers. A scalar on a matrix multiplies each of its numbers. Basically the same thing. So let's look at a quick example. If we've got 3 multiplying on the matrix 1, negative 4, 10, negative 19, negative 7, 20, then we have 3 multiplies on the first row, first uh, column, and that's going to get 3 times 1 gets us 3, so same location, now multiplied by 3. 3 times negative 4 gets us negative 12, same location, just multiplied by 3. 3 times 10 gets us 30. 3 times negative 19, negative 57. 3 times negative 7, negative 21. 3 times 20, 60. Great. Matrix addition. Given two matrices A and B that have the same order, they have to have the same order, otherwise it won't work. We'll see why that is in just a second. We can add the two matrices together. So A plus B, every ith row, jth column of the resultant matrix will wind up being Aij plus Bij. That is to say, we're adding together entries that come from the same location, right? So if he was from this place over here and he was from this place over here, these two different numbers, we add them together and that comes out to be that new place in our new matrix that we're creating. Note that this is very similar to adding vectors component-wise. It's very much the same thing as when we added vectors, right? If you add two vectors, you just take the first components, you put them together. The second components, you put them together. The third components, you add them together until you get through the entire vector. If we're doing it with a matrix, it's the same thing except instead of Components, we now have to do it to each of the entries. So first row, first column entries, you add them together. First row, second column entries, you add them together until you get done with that row. Then second row, first column entries, you add them together. Second row, second column entries, you add them together. Second row, third column, etc., etc., until you've made it through all the rows and all the columns. So you take a given location, you put the things together from that location, that gives you the value for the uh, same location in the new matrix. Let's look at an example. So if we've got the matrix 4, 8, negative 3, 7, and 1, 3, 3, 0, we take first row, first column in both of them, so 4 plus 1, and that spits out 5 in the first row, first column in our new matrix. Same thing for first row, second column, 8 and 3 in them respectively. 8 plus 3 becomes 11, second row, first column, sorry, first row, second column, same location as what it just came from in our new matrix. Same thing over here, negative 3 plus 3 becomes 0, and finally 7 plus 0 becomes positive 7.
Great. So we're keeping the location, adding them together, and that's what we get in our new matrix. Matrix multiplication. Now, this one is going to be very different. So the previous two made sense, right? They were a lot like what we were used to doing with vectors. You multiply everything with a scalar, you add based on location with addition. Matrix multiplication, this one's going to twist your brain a little bit. So it's confusing at first, but the applications in a couple lessons will hopefully make us see why we wind up doing this kind of confusing thing, because there winds up being some purpose to this stuff. Um, but for now, we're not going to really have a very good understanding of why that has to be the case. So we just want to be careful and follow the rules precisely and pay close attention when you multiply matrices. It's really, really easy to make mistakes with multiplying matrices, especially the first couple times you're doing it. So you really have to be very careful and pay attention. So just follow these rules carefully. It's going to be confusing at first, but don't worry. As we work through a bunch of examples, it'll make a lot more sense. The formal definition, the first thing that we're going to see, that's probably the most confusing thing of all. But as we see it in action, it'll start to make a lot more sense. So just work through it. You'll wind up understanding this by the time we get to the examples. No problem. All right. If we've got some matrix A, and it's an M by N matrix, and B is an N by P matrix, we can multiply them together. So notice that the N here and the N here, they match up. So M rows, N columns in our first matrix, N rows, P columns in our second matrix. So the number of columns in the first matrix matches up with the number of rows in the second matrix. That's an important idea. It will come up later on. We can multiply them together, and we create a new matrix A, B. So that's going to wind up being M by P, the things that didn't match up. Or they could match up, but they don't have to match up. And we define A, B as A, B, the ith row, jth column of A, B becomes C, I, J, where C, I, J is equal to A, I, 1, B, 1, J, plus A, I, 2, B, 2, J, up until we get to A, I, N, B, N, J. What does that mean? Let's look at that a little bit. So A, I, 1 is the ith row of A first entry, right? So A, I, th row of N, uh, I th row of A first entry. The B, 1, J is the first entry of the J, th column, right? Because it's the first row, but in our jth column, so it's the first entry. So it's the first entry i throw A, first entry jth column B. A I2 is second entry i throw of A, and B2J is second entry jth column of B. So we multiply those together, we add them together with the other ones, we keep doing this down the line where it's the nth entry of i throw of A and the nth entry of the jth column of B. Notice that the nth entry in both of those cases winds up being the last entry in that matrix. As if A is an M by N matrix, then for our A right here, I N, well, the i th row has to stop at the nth entry because it only has N many columns to work its way through. Same thing with B and J. The nth entry in the jth column has to stop there because it has only n many rows to work through to have things there. So that winds up stopping, and they stop at the same place, which is useful. All right. So that is the entry Cij of AB, the product of the two. The entry in its ith row and its jth column is the sum of the products of corresponding entries from A's ith row and B's jth column. So we're looking at the i throw of our first one, our first matrix A, its i throw times the jth column of B, our second matrix. We're multiplying them together based on first entries, second entries, third entries, fourth entries. We multiply them together and then we add them all up together, and that winds up giving us the value for the resultant product matrix in its i throw and jth column. I know, it's confusing right now. It'll make a lot more sense as soon as we start working on the examples. So we can see this visually as taking the ith row, right? This is the ith row of A. And then here, this would wind up being the jth column of B. So our first matrix, matrix, matrix is ith row times the second matrix is jth column, and we multiply them together where AI1 times B1J plus AI2 times B2J, right? The first entry here times the first entry here, the second entry here times the second entry here, the third entry here times the third entry here. We multiply them all together like that, and then we sum everything up, and that winds up producing CIJ, which is the ith row and jth column. All right. 
That's what we wind up getting here. All right, ready for an example. So let's look at how we would find the entry in the first row and third column of the product from the matrices below. So if we're looking for the first row, then that's going to be the first row of our first matrix, so 2, negative 1. Then the third column, columns are going to come from the second matrix, so third column, 1, 2, 3, third column here, 5, 0. So the first entries, 2 times 5, so that's 2 times 5 plus negative 1 times 0 negative 1 times 0. 2 times 5 plus negative 1 times 0 gets us 10. So 10 is what goes here in the first row and third column. That's what we wind up getting. We wind up getting this number 10. So we're taking that first row, the third column, we're multiplying together in this sort of strange way, we're adding up, and we're plugging that in as the place, uh, we're putting that in for the entry in the matrix that we're creating. Now, notice that this bears some resemblance to dot products, right? We can think of this i throw as being a vector because it's just got a bunch of, you know, pieces to it. It's got a bunch of components to it. Since it's just one dimension in one way, it's just a vector in one way, right? Two and then negative one. And then we've got this jth column over here, right? We can think of this as also being a column vector. So we've got this vector here, this vector here, we're taking the dot product with them. 2, negative 1, dotted with 5, 0, 2 times 5, 10, negative 1 times 0, 0, so we get a total of 10. So we can think of it as being the ith row dotted with the jth column. If you think that's confusing, if you never really had a very good understanding of how dot products worked in vectors, that's perfectly fine. Don't worry about that. Just think of it in terms of multiplying and multiplying like this. But if dot product stuff made a lot of sense to you in vectors, you can think of it as turning this row into a vector briefly, turning this column into a vector briefly, taking the dot product, and then moving on, doing the same thing with a new, new vectors in a sort of vector sense. It's not exactly like vector because it's working inside of a matrix, but it's working very much under that same idea of multiplying based on location location of entry, and then adding it all together. All right, so let's work this whole thing out. So we'll use red to talk about everything that this first row is going to. What is the size of this going to come out to? First, let's figure that out so we can draw in a bars for where we're going to multiply. So this is a 1, 2, 3, so it is a 3 by 2 matrix, because there's two columns, and this has two rows and three columns, so it's a 2 by 3 matrix. So the two and the two match up here. So what's going to wind up coming out over here is our size is a three by three matrix. And that also makes sense because in our first matrix, we've got three rows. And in our second matrix, we've got three columns. So each of the things that will come out in our product is a way of putting a row and a column together. So three rows, three columns, they wind up stacking into a three by three product matrix. All right. So with that in mind, we know that what's going to have to come out of this is a three by three matrix. So I'll leave enough room approximately to put in a three by three matrix inside of there. So first one, first row, first column, will give us the location that is the first row, first column in our product matrix. So two times two, and negative one times negative three, then added together. So two times two, four, negative one times negative three, positive three, so four plus three, seven. Two negative one on one three, first row on second column, two times one, 2, negative 1 times 3, negative 3, add those together, you get negative 1. 2, negative 1 on 5, 0, 2 times 5, 10, negative 1 times 0, 0, so we get 10. So there's our first row after we've worked through all three columns. Next one, let's use a new color here, so 3, 4 on 2, negative 3, so 3 times 2 gets us 6, 4 times negative 3 gets us negative 12, so it comes out to negative 6. 3, 4 on 1, 3, 3 times 1, 3, 4 times 3, 12, so that gets us 15 when we add them together. 3, 4 on 5, 0, 3 times 5 is 15, 4 times 0 is still 0, so that totals to 15. Last one, final color, 0, 5 on 2, negative 3, so 2, negative 3, 0 times 2, 0, 5 times negative 3, negative 15, 0 times 1, 0, 5 times 3, positive 15, and 0 times 5, 0, 5 times 0, 0, 0. And that's our final result. So we're working through by sort of taking a row in our first matrix, then multiplying it against a column 
in our second matrix and we're doing location of entry, first entries, second entries, third entries, fourth entries, as many as we have entries. We multiply the location of entries, first entries together, second entries together, third entries together, multiply based on that, and then sum up the whole thing. And that what, that's what gets us what comes out of our product for that, that row number and that column number. It makes a lot more sense after you just wind up working with it, after you wind up getting some practice in. So as soon as you start working on examples like this yourself, as soon as you do some practice homework, it'll make a whole lot more sense. But we'll also get the chance to work on another example a little bit later. All right. Matrix multiplication and order. To multiply two matrices together, we have to first be sure that their orders are compatible. We've talked about this a little bit so far. The numbers of columns in the first matrix must equal the number of rows in the matrix, in the second matrix. So the number of columns in the first matrix must be the same as the number of rows in the second matrix. And then what comes out of it is this M by P. So A, B, M by P. So we've got N columns in our first matrix, times n rows in our second matrix. So why is this the case, right? We can just believe this rule, but let's also get a sense for why it's the case. Well, consider this. If I've got, say, a 3 by 2 matrix, right? I've got a 3 by 2 matrix. Let's use red so we can back, so we can see how it matches here. So if we've got a 3 by 2 matrix here. Then we've got something here, something here, something here, something here, something here, something here, right? So notice that if you look at the length of any row, the length of any row is two. So the length of a row is based on how many columns you have, because each column is an entry. So if we look at a row, then it's going to span all of those columns. So it's going to be a question of how many times does it have something to go inside of the row? Well, that's going to be a question of how many columns are going through that row. So the number of entries in a row is going to be based on the number of columns. Similarly, if we have a two by three matrix, then it's going to be two rows, three columns. If we grab some column, how many entries are going to be in the column? Well, it's how many rows it goes deep. So the number of rows is going to tell us how many entries are in a given column. Now, the way matrix multiplication works is it's this thing, the row, times this thing, the column, right? It's the row times the column. So if the row times the column, well, this whole thing has to be first entries against first entries, second entries against second entries, third entries against third entries. So we have to have the number of entries match up, right? If we've got a different length in the row and a, then the column, they're different lengths versus row versus column, we're not going to have them match up. This thing doesn't really make sense. So we're required, the idea of this is for the length here to match up to the length here. And that's why we've got this requirement is because the length of a row is based on how many columns it has. The length of a column is based on how many rows it has. So that's why we've got to have these matching here. Otherwise, it won't make sense for the way we've got this thing defined because we'll have something longer than the other thing. And what do you multiply by then? Because you don't have the same number of entries. It doesn't make any sense, right? When you take dot products with vectors, they have to have the same number of components for you to be able to take a dot product. Sort of the same thing going on here. Matrix multiplication is not commutative. So this is absolutely mind-blowing because it's not something that we've seen anywhere else in math at this point, I'm pretty sure. So at this point, we probably want to know what does it mean to be commutative before we try to understand matrices, matrices not being commutative. So let's look at that. Commutative means that x times y is the same thing as y times x. That this operation from the left is the same thing as the operation from the right. x on the left of y is the same thing as y, uh, sorry, as x on the right of y. x times y equals y times x. It doesn't matter which direction that x multiplies from. You get the same thing out of it, at least in the real numbers. You know, 5 times 7 is the same thing as 7 times 5. 8 times negative 3 is the exact same thing as negative 3 times 8. So that's something we're pretty used to that makes a lot of sense to us. It doesn't matter which direction you multiply from. It comes out to be the same thing, so we've never had to worry about it. Well, it's time to start worrying about it. Matrices are not commutative in general. That is, for most matrices A and B, AB is not equal to BA. It's totally different if A multiplies on the left side or if A multiplies on the right side. You'll get totally different things. Now, there are some cases when AB will be equal to BA. It's not an absolute hard and fast rule that AB can never equal BA. It's just like 99% of the time, AB will not be equal to BA. Given two random matrices, chances are they're not going to wind up being the same depending on how you 
depending on the order of multiplication. So you have to pay attention to who is multiplying from which side. You'll have totally different things depending on changing the order of multiplication usually. There are some cases where it won't be, but for the most part, totally different things. So you can't rely on having x times y equal to y times x because all of a sudden it's not equal to the same thing. You're going to have to pay attention to the order that things are multiplying. Let's look at an example to really drive this home. So if we have this first matrix 4, 2, negative 3, 1, and 3, 0, negative 5, 2, then we know we're going to get a 2 by 2 matrix out of this because they're both 2 by 2. So 2, 4, 2 on 3, 5, negative 5, 4 times 3 gets us 12, 2, negative 5 gets us negative 10, so that comes out to 2, 4, 2 on 0, 2, 4 times 0, 0, 2 times 2, 4, negative 3 on 1, Let's use a new color here. So negative 3 on 1. So negative 3, 1 on 3, negative 5. Negative 3 times 3 gets us negative 9. 1 times negative 5 gets us negative 5. So negative 14 total. Negative 3, 1 on 0, 2. Negative 3, 0, 0, 1 on 2, 2. OK, so that's what that first matrix came out to be. What about this one here, where we flip the order of multiplying them? So we've got 3, 0 on 4, negative 3 now. Once again, we're going to come out as a 2 by 2 matrix. So 3, 0 on 4, negative 3. 3 times 4, 12. 0 on negative 3, 0. So we've got 12. So at this point, we already see, hey, they're not the same. In the first one we did, that first multiplication, our first row, first column was 2. In the second one, our first row, first column was 12. So 2 versus 12 totally different. We know that these matrices cannot be the same anymore because one of their entries is different, and that's enough to say that they're not equal. However, let's get a sense for just how different they are. Let's look at the rest of this thing. So 3, 0, first row on the second column now. 3, 0 on 2, 1. 3 times 2 gets a 6. 0 times 1 gets a 0, so 6. Negative 5, 2. So negative 5, 2 on 4, negative 3. Negative 5 times 4, negative 20. 2 times negative 3, negative 6. So negative 26. Negative 5, 2 on 2, 1. Negative 10 plus 2 gets us negative 8. So notice, these things are totally and utterly different. 2, 4, negative 14, 2 is completely different than 12, 6, negative 26, negative 8. So this is a case that really helps us see how different these things are. AB is not equal to BA in a single one of its entries. We get totally different things. So the order of multiplication, if you're multiplying from the left or you're multiplying from the right, that really, really matters. And that's going to affect how we pay attention to doing matrix algebra in the next two lessons. So that's something to think about later on. But for right now, you just have to be aware that AB times BA, totally different. Swapping the order of matrix multiplication means you have to do it again because you have no idea what's going to come out of it until you actually work through it. All right. Finally, it's two special matrices to talk about. First off, the zero matrix. The zero matrix is a matrix that has, no big surprise, zero for all of its entries. A zero matrix can be made with any order at all. It is denoted by a zero as bold. However, if you're writing it by hand, normally you can just tell by writing a zero, and people will know from context that that zero is supposed to be a zero matrix, depending on how the problem's working. But if you really want to denote it, you could probably like put some underlines underneath it or something to show that it's really important whatever you want to be able to see that it is definitely a matrix, but for the most part, just writing a zero if it's next to other matrices, people will know what you're talking about. If you need to show its order, you can write it with a subscript of m by n. So that tells us that zero matrix will have m rows, n columns. So for example, if we had 3 by 3, then we've got 3 rows and 3 columns of nothing but zeros. If we have 5 by 2, then we have 5 rows and 2 columns of nothing but zeros. For any matrix A, A minus A comes out to be the zero matrix because each of its entries will be subtracted by its entries again, so each entry will turn into a zero, we get the zero matrix. And also zero, the zero matrix times A, equals the zero matrix, which is equal to A times the zero matrix. So the zero matrix multiplying on some other matrix by the left or the right turns it into the zero matrix. The zero matrix through multiplication crushes other matrices into the zero matrix. All right. Finally, the identity matrix. The identity matrix is a square matrix, always going to be a square, that has 1 for all its entries on the main diagonal and 0 for 
other entries. It can be any order as long as it's a square. It's denoted with the symbol capital I. So capital I, you just write that out like a normal capital I. If you need to show what its order is, and remember its order is going to have to be n by n because it has to have the same number of rows and columns so we can't have different numbers there, we can use just I with a subscript of n because we don't have to say n by n because it has to be square so we just use one, one number, one letter. So if we want to talk about I2, then that would be a two by two matrix with ones on the diagonal, zeros everywhere else. If we want to talk about I5, the identity matrix has a five by five, then that's ones on this main diagonal from the top left down to the bottom right. And it's going to be zeros everywhere else. So zeros everywhere else on the thing. But why is this identity matrix useful? For any matrix A, any matrix at all, as long as they match up in orders appropriately, and there's always going to be some identity ma matrix that will match up appropriately with any given matrix, identity matrix A is equal to A, and A times the identity matrix is equal to A. So the identity matrix multiplied from the left or the identity matrix multiplied from the right comes out to be just whatever matrix we'd started with that wasn't the identity matrix. So the identity matrix effectively works the same as multiplying a real number by one, right? Five times one just comes out to be five. Negative 20 billion times one just comes out to be negative 20 billion. The identity matrix works the same way. I times A just comes out to be A. I times C just comes out to be C. So whatever matrix we've got, we multiply it by the identity matrix. It's the multiplicative identity. It just leaves it as it normally was. It leaves its identity alone. It leaves it the same. Right, ready for some examples. So first off, a little bit of scalar multiplication. So let's do the scalar multiplication and then we'll do the subtraction or addition. So two times ne five, negative seven, two, 11, three, negative four. Its order stays the same. So two times five is 10, two times negative seven, negative 14, two on two, four, two on 11, 22, two on three, six, and two on negative four is negative eight. So at this point, I'm going to change this into a plus, and I'm going to say we had negative three here, right? Plus negative three times something is the same thing as minus three times something, right? We can pull that negative out and put it on the scalar instead. So we do that here. Negative three times three gets us negative nine. Negative three times negative two gets us positive six. Negative three times two gets us negative six. Negative three times six gets us negative 18. Negative three times zero gets us zero. Negative three times negative five gets us positive 15. At this point, we're ready to combine them. We combine the two things together. So we do it based on location. So 10 and negative 9 will go in first row, first column, because they came from the first row and first column. 10 and negative 9 gets us 1. It's going to have the same order here. Negative 14 and 6 gets us negative 8. Negative 6 and 4. 4 and negative 6 gets us negative 2. 22 and negative 18 gets us positive 4. 6 and 0 gets us positive 6. Negative 8 and 15. And we have 7. And there is our matrix. All right. Now, we could have done this a different way, right? At this point up here, we chose to do plus onto a negative scalar. But we could have left it with subtraction. So if we'd chosen to left, left it as subtraction, our first matrix would have remained the same. 10, negative 14, still the same scalar, so nothing's going to change here on that first matrix. And now it's going to be minus, and we could multiply that scalar by instead. So we're going to leave it as a subtraction, but we're just going to multiply that positive 3 as if it hadn't been changed over, as it, it wasn't changed over. So 3 times 3 gets us 9, 3 times negative 2 gets us negative 6, 3 times 2 gets us positive 6, 3 times 6 gets us positive 18, 0, and negative 15, right? So notice, the only difference between these two matrices is this negative sign having hit everything. So at this point, we can subtract, and we'd wind up having 10 minus 9, 10 minus 9 comes out to be 1. Negative 14 minus negative 6, negative 14 minus negative 6, well, minus negative 6 becomes plus 6, negative 14 plus 6 is negative 8. 4 minus 6, negative 2, 22 minus 18, 4, 6 minus 0, 6, negative 8 minus 15, sorry, minus negative 15 becomes plus 15, negative 8 plus 15 becomes positive 7. So we wind up getting the exact same thing, right? Whichever way we do it winds up coming out to be the same thing, which is what we'd hope. 
I would, for the most part, recommend doing this method that I did here, where you make it positive, you make it addition, and you put the negative on the, uh, on the scalar. So you swap it from being subtraction to addition, and then you put the negative on the scalar, and then you multiply that through, because it gives you one less thing to have to keep track of, as opposed to having to remember the entire time, I'm subtracting, I'm subtracting, I'm subtracting, because then if you forget to subtract just once, your answer's gone, you'll have the wrong answer. But if you put the negative on it there, then you remember to multiply by the negative the whole time through, and then from there it's just addition. I think it's easier that way, but if you think it'd be easier by doing subtraction, go ahead and do that. Whatever works best for you is what you want to use, but I personally would recommend multiplying by the negative and doing addition as opposed to keeping around subtraction, but they'll both work just fine. Next example, A is this matrix, B is this matrix, C is this matrix. If a matrix multiplication below is possible, give the order, the size of the matrix that it would result in. So we've got A, B times B, and okay, so to do that, the first thing we're going to have to do is we're first going to have to talk about what are each one of these sizes. So if we've got three rows, two columns, that is a three by two matrix for A. B is two columns, three rows, so that is a two by three matrix for B, and C is three rows, three columns, it's square, so we've got a three by three matrix here. Great. So at this point, it's a question of comparing, do these things match up? So AB is going to be three times two, sorry, not three times two, but three by two, sorry about that, three by two, multiplying against a matrix that is two by three. So to do this, we have to have the first one's number of columns has to match the second one's number of rows. But an easier way to do this is to just think in terms of the inner numbers. Are the inner numbers the same? Well, inner numbers are both two. So now what's going to result is the outer numbers, right? We get those outer numbers as the resultant size of the matrix. So we'll get a three by three matrix in the end. If we reverse this and looked at B times A, then we'd have a two by three matrix times a three by two matrix. We check, are the inner numbers the same? Three and three are the same, so it becomes the outer numbers will be our resultant, so we'll get a two by two. So notice, A, B, and B, A, they're very different in the end, and we can see that just based on the fact that they have totally different orders. So you're gonna wind up getting different sizes as well based on it. So not only are they different commutative, are they not commutative, we, don't, we can't rely on you know, A, B being the same thing as B, A. We can't even rely on the size remaining the same. Next up, let's look at C on B. So that's a three by three times a two by three. So in this case, do they match up? Does two match up with three? Are they the same number? No, they don't match up, so we have no solution here. A on C, a three by two matrix multiplied with a, oops, sorry, need to switch to green, three by three matrix. Do they match up? Three and two, they don't match up, so we don't have anything that comes out of that as a result. And finally, C, A, B. Well, can we multiply multiple matrices together? Sure, we do one matrix multiplication, that comes out of another matrix, and then just multiply the resultant thing. So let's see if we can work through this. So C, A, B is a three by three, multiplied by a three by two, multiplied by a two by three. So our first question, we want to do, let's work from the left to the right. So we'll look at what did CA become, and then we'll multiply by B. So CA, we've got a three here, we've got a three here. So that's going to result in a three by two, right? That's what CA would come out as, times B still, we have to do B, two by three. So now we ask, do they match on the inside? Hey, they match on the inside, so what's going to result is a three by three. And there's our answer. Let's also look at it if we'd gone from another direction. If instead of going from the left, we came from the right. We'd hope that that would work out, because if it didn't, then there's some issues with how we have this stuff set up. So let's look at CAB. If we'd done CAB, right? From the right side to the left. So we've got the same thing. A three by three is C. A is a three by two, and B is a two by three. So now we're working from the right side. So what does A, B come out to be? Well, that's a two here and a two here, so that comes out to be three. And hey, look, we already did this. We already figured out what A, B is. We know that should come out to be a three by three. So from there, we have a three by three matrix. And then what came out of A, B is a three by three matrix. Do the threes match up? A, hey, the threes match up. So what we get in the end is a three by three matrix. So that checks out either way we did it, it's the same. One last thing to point out here. Hey, look, if we had a three by three, we had CAB one more time. 
3 by 2 and then a 2 by 3. Well, what we can do is we can say the inner parts, do the inner parts match? Inner part here matches. Hey, and inner parts here match. Ultimately, what's going to happen is all the inner parts are required to match for multiplication to happen, but they all disappear. The only thing that winds up making it out in the end is the things on the far edges, that three and that, that the three on both sides, three and three. So what's going to come out in the end is a three by three. So if you've got multiple matrices multiplying against each other, you can just check and make sure that all of the inner numbers match up against each other. And then what the size of the resulting thing will wind up just being the far edge numbers, what our edge numbers were in this case, three and three. All right, next example. So big, big one of matrix multiplication. We're going to work to simplify this. So first off, let's see what size is our product going to come out to be. So we've got a three by three and a three by three. Hey, it is possible. No surprise there since it was given to us as a problem. So that's going to come out as a three by three matrix. So at this point, let's work it out. Since we're working with a three by three matrix, we'll leave a nice big chunk of space for us to work inside of. So we're going to work this out. So the first row, times the first column, all right? First row times the first column to get the, lo the number that's going to go in our first row, first column of our resultant product matrix. So six, first entry of the first row times the first row of the first, sorry, first entry of the first column, negative two, added to two, second entry of the first row times the second entry of our first column, plus three times the, uh, the final entry, the third entry of our first row times the final entry, the third entry of our first column. So we work that out. We get negative 12 plus 8 minus 3. We get negative 15 plus 8. So we get negative 7. So we have negative 7 for the entry, that first row, first column entry. So that's what's going on behind the scenes. We're taking that row, we're taking that column, we're multiplying them based on how the entries multiply together, matching the entries, multiplying matching entries, and then summing up the whole thing. And we can see that as I just wrote it out there. So clearly, this takes a lot of arithmetic, right? We're doing three multiplications, three additions. It's tough to do this. I would recommend if you aren't like excellent at doing mental math, really try to keep like some scratch paper that you're doing on the side. Be very, very careful working through a calculator. It's so easy to make mistakes with matrix multiplication, especially the first couple times you're doing it. It's something you really have to be careful with the first couple times. And it's something you always have to be careful with because you can always easily make mistakes. Even I will very easily make mistakes with matrix multiplication. But if you just stay focused, you pay attention to these rules carefully and you work carefully, um, you can always make sure that you get the answer right. But just really be careful with matrix multiplication. It's an easy place to make simple mistakes where you understand what's going on, but you just made a you know little arithmetic error and it screws up your answer. So be careful. All right. So I'm going to do the rest of these just working through my head and talking them out because I'm pretty good at this. But you know, be careful when you're doing it. If you're not really good at doing this sort of stuff in your head, be careful. Do it in scratch paper. And the larger the matrices get, the harder it is to do in your head. So 6, 2, 3 on 1, 2, 0. So first row on the second column. 6 times 1, 6. 2 times 2, 4. 6 plus 4 is 10. 3 times 0, 0. So we get 10. And then final column, 6, 2, 3 on negative 3, 0, 1. 6 times negative 3, negative 18. 2 times 0, 0, so still negative 18. 3 times 1, 3. So negative 18 plus 3 is negative 15. Next one, let's switch to a new color. So second row, 1, 0, negative 8. Multiply that by the first row. So second row, first column is going to be 1, 0, negative 8 on negative 2, 4, negative 1. 1 times negative 2, negative 2. 0 times 4, 0. So negative 2 plus negative 8 times negative 1 becomes positive 8. So negative 2 plus positive 8 becomes uh, positive 6. Um, next one, 1, 0, negative 8 on 1, 2, 0. 1 times 1 is 1. 0 times 2 is 0. Negative 8 times 0 is 0. So we just get 1 out of that. 1, 0, negative 8 on negative 3, 0, 1. 1 times negative 3 is negative 3. 0 and 0, 0. Negative 8 times 1 is negative 8. So negative 3 plus negative 8 becomes negative 11. And then finally, negative 7, 3, 5. So negative 7, 3, 5 on negative 2, 4, negative 1. So negative 7 times negative 2 becomes positive 14. 3 times 4 becomes positive 12. So positive 14 plus positive 12 becomes positive 26. 5 times negative 1, negative 5. 26 minus 5 is 21. Okay. Negative 7, 3, 5 on 1, 2, 0. Negative 7 times 1, negative 7. 3 times 2, 6. So negative 7 plus 6 is negative 1. And then plus 5 times 0. So we just come out to be negative 1 here. And then final one. 
negative 7, 3, 5 on negative 3, 0, 1. Negative 7 times negative 3 becomes positive 21. 3 times 0, 0. Positive 21 still plus 5 times 1. So 5 times 1, 5. 21 plus 5, 26. Okay. So hopefully that points out just how much arithmetic you're like having to do in your head here. I really want you to be careful because this is the easiest way to make mistakes and it's the pretty silly way to wind up losing points on a test or a homework because it's not because you don't understand what's going on. It's just because you're trying to do so much arithmetic in your head. It's easy to make a mistake. So if you wind up having any difficulty, if something's particularly hard, just write it out on paper or if you've got a, like a really nice graphing calculator where you can see each of the numbers you're putting into it, be careful, watch, make sure that what you've got there matches up to what you've got on the paper and then make Make sure that you're being careful if you're using a calculator. So just be careful however you're approaching it. The actual process isn't that difficult once you get used to it, but it's always going to be a real chance of making mistakes just because there's so much arithmetic going on. All right, final example, prove that for any two by two matrix A, the zero matrix times A equals zero and the identity matrix times A equals A. So any two by two matrix A, so it says any. So that means we can't just use some two by two matrix. We can't actually put down numbers because we have to be able to have this true for any two by two matrix. So if we came up with some matrix like three, one, seven, 47, well, maybe it happens to be true for that matrix. So we have to figure out a way to be able to show that it's true for every matrix. So we need to write about this in a general form. So we do the same thing we have everything set up in where we use variables. Because if we have it as A, B, C, D, then, well, any two by two matrix, we can just swap out A, B, C, D for actual numerical values and we'll have any two by two matrix. This will be true for any two by two matrix. So we've got that as an idea. So now we can just try multiplying. If this is going to work for this, you know, this A here, A, B, C, D, that's a stand-in for any two by two matrix at all. So if we can show that the zero matrix times this comes out to be zero anyway, then it's gotta be true for all of them because they're just going to wind up swapping out the variables A, B, C, D for actual numbers. So let's try this. Zero matrix times A equals zero. Well, if we got the zero matrix, then we're gonna have zero, 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 zero because it's multiplying against a two by two. So our A is A, B, C, D. This is actually a pretty easy matrix multiplication, thankfully. Zero and zero times A and C. Well, hey, look, that's going to crush it down to zero. We know we're going to have to get a two by two matrix because we started with two by two times two by two. Zero, zero on B, D. Well, zero times B, zero times D. Hey, that comes out to be zero. Zero, zero on A, C, zero times A, zero times C. Hey, that comes out to be zero. Zero, zero on B, D, zero times B, zero times D. No surprise there, it comes out to be zero. So we see because it's got nothing but zeros that we're multiplying by, whatever it's gonna hit, is gonna get turned to a zero. So that's why the zero matrix multiplied by any matrix at all winds up coming out to be the zero matrix. So this checks out. And we can see that if we had, you know, put it as the zero matrix multiplying from the right as opposed to the left, basically the same thing's going to happen because whatever we're multiplying against, it's going to hit nothing by zero, so it's just going to get turned to zeros automatically. So zero matrix multiplied against any matrix becomes the zero matrix. Next, the identity matrix times A. Let's show that that becomes A. So identity matrix, well, A is a two by two, so that means our identity matrix will have to also be a two by two. So one's on the main diagonals, zero's everywhere else, main diagonal. One, one, sorry, one, zero, zero, one. Main diagonal has ones, and then everything else will have zero. So in this case, not many zeros. A, B, C, D. So this will take a little bit more thought. One, zero, so one, zero, on AC. So one times A, we're going to have to get a two by two because it started with two two by two matrices. One times A comes out to be A. Zero times C becomes zero, so we've got A. One times one zero on BD, well one times B comes out to be B. Zero times D comes out to be zero, so we get just B. Zero one on AC, zero times A comes out to be zero. One times C comes out to be C. A. Zero, 01 on BD, 0 times B comes out to be 0, 1 times D comes out to be D. Hey, that checks out, wound up being the same thing. So it's a little bit harder to see why the identity matrix is working, but basically what it's doing is when you multiply some some other matrix by it, since it's got just a one in one place, it's seeing, hey, who is at the same location over here? A, a is at the same location, B is at the same location. So they wind up popping out. For this one down here, zero and one, it's saying who's at the same location, C, D wind up, so they get to pop out as well. Similar thing winds up happening if we multiply the identity matrix from the right instead of from the left. 
try it out for yourself. Take a look if you're curious about seeing it. All right, so that shows everything that we've got. We've got a pretty good understanding of how matrices work at this point. We're ready to go see some of the cool things we can start doing with them. So we'll talk about some new ideas in the next section, the next lesson, and then two lessons from now, we'll see just how powerful these things can be for solving really problems that would seem really difficult. We're going to turn so easy so quickly. All right, we'll see you at educator.com later. Bye.